awake. The walk the walk of God God is near. Get ready. The walk of God is near. Bear witness. The love of God is near. This is the second Sunday in Advent. Today, we light two purple candles. You are invited to do the same at home. Advent is a time of expectation. We hope for the day when we celebrate again the birth of Jesus. Let us pray. Loving and compassionate God, when we look at the two candles, we remember your promise to send a savior to the people. When we read the Bible, we hear that we are to get ready. Kindle the flame of expectation in us and help us, O oh God, to prepare for the coming of the Christ child. Amen. Amen.
Good morning, St. John's. Will you pray with me? And now, O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of the hearts of all of us be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Mark's gospel begins with his Advent announcement of the good news about Jesus Christ, God's Son. Perhaps none of us can believe it. Perhaps none of us is ready for it. But it is surely upon us today. Like clockwork, on every second Sunday of Advent, we hear John the Baptist announcing the dawn of a new era. Just as Isaiah, Isaiah predicted it, John now proclaims it. His is the voice crying out from the Judean wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. You see, at the time, popular Judaism clung to the expectation that one day God would bring in the Messianic age, setting all things right and restoring the fortunes of Israel and placing an ideal king on the throne of David. But for 400 years before John the Baptist was born, there had been no prophet in Israel. The life of the average Jew was pretty miserable as the skies above remained silent. But now with John's preaching in the wilderness, the sound of the prophetic voice could again be heard in the land. Dressed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, eating locusts and wild honey, it was no accident that Mark included such a detailed description of John's appearance. Surely this was a statement of some kind meant to point us toward John's prophetic identity. And indeed it was. Because John was wearing the exact same outfit that the Old Testament prophet Elijah wore centuries before him. And perhaps we picture John as some sort of caveman character. But Mark is very deliberate about the description of John's clothing and eating habits. They are intended to bring to mind the memory and presence of Elijah. John's appearance in the wilderness is meant to be a sign of the Messianic age, meaning that all that Israel had been living toward, the deepest hope of the Jewish people, is about to happen. Can't you just imagine the crowds streaming down to the river, shopkeepers and farmers, religious leaders and simple folk, the well-behaved and the desperate, the doubters and the certain. People by the thousands. Oh, some were probably just curious onlookers interested in what all the fuss was about. But others, perhaps most in the crowd, came with a profound yearning for another way of being, a better way of living, a higher sense of justice. Even in the darkest of times, or perhaps because of the darkness of those times, something deep down in the spirit of those people drew them into the wilderness. Suffering under the cruel yoke of Rome, their hope was nearly lost. But here stood John the Baptist in his pulpit, thundering the astounding good news. One stronger than I am is coming after me. I'm not even worthy to bend over and loosen the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You see, the air bristled with possibility. There is a new king coming. This dream of a world of peace and restoration is very near. Barbara Brown Taylor writes, This may explain why people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were making the pilgrimage out to hear his message. To be baptized in the River Jordan, confessing their sins. But it is still kind of funny, really, when you think about it, she says. This is exactly the kind of guy that you and I would avoid at all costs. He's like those wild-eyed evangelists who stand on the street corner shaking their Bibles in your face and telling you that you are going straight to hell if you don't repent this very instant. I've always secretly believed that descendants of John the Baptist are the ones who post those awful signs along the interstate. 
Repent, the end is near. Prepare to meet thy maker. But as Taylor points out, there is one major difference between those guys and John the Baptist. Self-appointed prophets, well, they tend to plant themselves right in your way. So you have to cross to the other side of the street to avoid them. They get in your face and they dare you to ignore them. Whereas John planted himself in the middle of nowhere. He set up shop in the wilderness and anyone who wanted to hear what he had to say had to go to a lot of trouble to get there. Borrowing the neighbor's donkey or setting off on foot with enough water for the journey, which led down lonely trails infested with bandits. You have to wonder why someone would do a thing like that especially someone from Jerusalem, which was where the temple was, and the rabbis, and all the accumulated wisdom of the religious establishment. If someone wanted to hear from God, why not stay right there? Maybe attend some extra services or make an appointment with one of the chief priests. Anyone who would turn away from all that and set off for the wilderness was looking for something else. And clearly, John had what they wanted and what they needed. People were attracted to him, not only because of who he was or what he said, but also because of what he offered them, a way to show that they wanted to change their hearts and lives and that they wanted God to forgive their sins. It was their chance to come clean, to stop pretending that they were someone else and start over again. Trouble is, when we hear the term change your heart or the term confess your sins, we aren't thinking about it as if it were an invitation. Far from it. The term confession conjures up all sorts of negative emotions feeling sorry for what we've done wrong, guilty about our past, or groveling for forgiveness because of some sin we've committed. It's true, confess is a loaded word that will leave a bad taste in our mouth if it's reduced to simply listing all the bad things we have done. But I'm not at all convinced that that was what John the Baptist was after. Now, instead of hanging their heads in shame, I think he wanted his wilderness congregation to change their ways. The true spirit of confession isn't so much beating ourselves up over our past failure as it is courageously and humbly turning from one way of being toward another, from one worldview to a different competing and compelling vision. It is a reorienting of priorities, a reformulation of values, a change in the way we cope with life and make major decisions. To confess is not to feel bad. Rather, it is to have a change of heart. Tom Long uses the example of racism to make this very point. Repenting of the sin of systemic racism, he writes, is much more than admitting that one has shown prejudice toward others or told jokes at the expense of another race. It means admitting that the entire framework of racism, the view that another race is somehow inferior or basically flawed, is wrong and evil. Repentance means turning away from that worldview and toward a basic vision of all races as cherished and valued in the eyes of God. Long is echoing John's message. Maybe we don't want to hear it, but it is certainly a timely one. Remember, it is in the God-forsaken wilderness that John's invitation comes, and it is an invitation one to experience conversion ourselves, to have our lives turned around by love, 
to be given a heart full of God's deep compassion to choose a new future. Look, it is three weeks before Christmas, and we are right there, right smack dab in the middle of the raw and risky wilderness. In the, in the wilderness of COVID fatigue, with a deep yearning to be together in church again without masks. In the wilderness of election exhaustion, desperate for the end of senseless court cases and polarizing politics. In the wilderness of addiction on the rise, despairing the COVID, cocaine, and meth crisis. In the wilderness of online teaching and preaching and learning and meeting. In the wilderness of this strange and stressful season. In the wilderness of suffering, loss, and fear. And it is the baptizer's voice that we hear calling to us across the ages. It is the very voice of Advent crying out, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. You see, it's John's pleading with us to examine our collective lifestyle and adjust it so that we will not have excess food and clothing when others go without. We will not use more than our share. We will not live off the interest gained from others' impoverishment. And there will be no such thing as a pipeline to prison or a war on drugs. Now, if you're thinking that this whole confession business is overwhelming, you'd be right. The implications are immense. There are things that we are simply required to give up. And let's face it, no one standing on a mountain wants the mountain to be flattened. But sometimes the high places that we seek to occupy must come low. And sometimes the low places in which we dwell must be elevated. Yes, the landscape must be wholly reimagined. And we must remember that we are not asked to do all this by ourselves overnight. Rather, we are being called to make a radical return to God, entrusting ourselves to God's word. One stronger than I am is coming after me, shouts John. I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit the spirit of the Holy One who promises a world renewed, the spirit of the Holy One who promises that which was is past, and a new day has begun to dawn. You see, in the emergency of the human condition, from the desperation of the Israelites into the reality of our unprecedented situation, John speaks a prophetic word of hope. God has not lost patience with the world. God is sending the Messiah to show us a better way. Prepare for the new advent of God among us. In this holy season, like the throngs who 2,000 years ago flocked to the River Jordan from the place of struggle, we confess our sins and await the coming of new hope for our lives. Because, friends, this is the primary place to experience God's newness, even if it is virtual, at a distance, and hugless. In worship together, we are reminded of our baptism and our place in the church, which makes us family. We tune into YouTube to renew and refresh our spirits for another week of service and to be empowered for ministry. We come here to virtually gather around the Advent wreath to be reminded of the vision, the hope, and the promise. And we come here to hear the good news again. Get ready. God is coming to mend our broken world. That's John's message in a nutshell. No matter how dreary and hopeless things seem, no matter how cynical and despairing you may feel, take hope. God is on the way. St. John's it is here, gathered together in these sacred moments that we are reminded of what Advent really means, the season of God's coming. 
that within and beyond the isolation and distance between us, within and beyond our desolation and despair, within and beyond the awful inhumanity of our politics, within and beyond all this, God comes, entering into the struggle with love enough, with peace enough, with hope enough to make things very, very, very different. Look, our text this week assumes that we are a people in the wilderness, and that we are. But on this, the second Sunday of Advent, God promises to come to us precisely in this wilderness. May we believe that. May we become brave voices of change in the hard places. And may we, with all that we are and all that we have, prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen. You know, one of the ways that we lower mountains and lift up the valleys is with our financial commitments. Your gifts make it possible for us to address hunger and addiction, homelessness and nakedness in concrete ways. Please take a moment now to go to the website to make your donations or fulfill your pledge if you haven't already done so.
go into the world to love God and serve our neighbor in all that we do so that those for whom wilderness love is a stranger will find in you generous friends. Go in peace. Amen.